economist. My colleague, Professor Morgan, is. He does a class in World Poverty and Development. Um, uh, each of us thought we would just sort of briefly uh, talk about um, the current situation there um, and address what might and might not work in terms of dealing with its problems. But we also um, have a special presentation from uh, the Bollingers regarding um, their work in Haiti. And we also want to allow time for you guys to um, interact uh, with us and really just have a dialogue here, a discussion about Haiti and its economic development. Okay, so um, the devastation facing Haiti from the earthquake we've all heard over the last few weeks, of course, is immense. If you just consider Port-au-Prince, which uh, you can see here on the map, the, um, on the star there, the capital of Haiti. This is a city now without reserves of food, water, power, shelter, hospitals, medicine, all kinds of things we take for granted. Uh, the reserves there are being depleted in Haiti. Hundreds of thousands of workers have had no wages for weeks. The banks are mostly closed. And uh, you look at Haiti almost reverting in some ways to a kind of barter economy. Because many of the Haitians um, rely upon uh, cash being transferred into them through the wire. By the way, where would that come from? What do you think? Where would that cash come, to, uh, come from to the native Haitians from? Where do you think that would be coming from? And uh, uh, why is it so devastating for them? Aaron? Yes, and so they're Haitians that are, uh, have uh, migrated to the U.S. and elsewhere. They're sending money back to their family, right? And so, um, who was it? Uh, his name, Pierre Garçon, right? If you know the, on the Colts in the Super Bowl yesterday, uh, was, it was a Haitian, and he's an example, of course, of someone um, there that uh, has family back in Haiti. So this is, um, that's been largely destroyed, and you're looking at Haiti now is very much almost a kind of city. So what's the best strategy to help Port-au-Prince, or for that matter, Haiti, for the long run? How can we avoid short-run fixes and instead address the fundamental economic and social problems facing the uh, 10 million Haitian people? Well, first, I think we need to begin with an orientation, at least a brief one, to the nation of Haiti. Haiti is a Caribbean country. Uh, it occupies about... Um, well, let me ask you guys. Do you all know how much of the island of Hispaniola that Haiti occupies? You can see on the right there's what? Dominican Republic. Haiti is about oh, a third or so. Yeah, the other two-thirds is uh, the Dominican Republic. And Haiti's economy makes it the poorest uh, country in the Americas. Just some other uh, elements that we're looking at with Haiti. Only about half of its people are literate. Um, Two-thirds of the Haitians work in the agricultural sector, but they only contribute about 30% of the uh, economy through the agricultural sector. So you've got uh, clearly some inefficiencies there when you have so many people working in that sector and yet um, not contributing as much of its output. Uh, what does uh, Haiti export agriculturally? Anybody have an idea to the rest of the world? What kind of products it sells? It, it has uh, sold sugarcane. And you have um, mango for good, good examples there. Um, for sad history, um, it's a former French colony. And certainly we could say it's been victimized by uh, slavery and oppression. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that's really true. If you think about um, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, its counterpart on, on the island. You know, they share the same island. And basic environment. Both have endured ruthless dictators. Uh, corruption and foreign invasions, and yet, anybody know how they're different? How, how we compare those two? There, what makes them so different? Same environment. Uh, anybody have an idea of how they're different, though? Both been. One of them uh, is, of course, the Dominican Republic. 
Haiti, on the other hand, 98% of it has been deforested. And it's really sad uh, that, that that's the case, deforestation. Um, the Dominican Republic, much higher per capita income, much higher income per person, $5,000 uh, on average, uh, taking the total income in the Dominican Republic divided by population. Anybody have an idea of what it is in Haiti? Yes, Chris. R roughly, at last estimate, it's about $800 per capita income. Okay, so obviously much um, lower income there uh, than its counterpart. Uh, and, you know, you think about how those kind of counterparts in other contexts, if you think about North Korea versus South Korea, same people, similar language spoke, spoken uh, in um, the 20th century, of course, East and West Germany, same kind of contrast, and uh, there's some interesting parallels there. But Haiti certainly is um, uh, on the poorer side there. Poorest country, in fact, in the Western Hemisphere. So um, what kind of institutional problems has Haiti faced? Well, it's got a very government. And um, this is really evident um, with the earthquake, but you know what? That was there prior to the earthquake. It, it had uh, really skimpy uh, public services that barely um, provided um, decent public services for uh, its people. Now with the earthquake, those have largely broken down. Haiti has some of the weakest property laws in the world as well as some of the most burdensome business regulations. And I think one of the things that you see here in contrast um, with some of the other nations that uh, have common law basis, have inherited um, their legal system from the British common law system, is that Haiti um, has inherited a civil law system that's very much reliant upon um, <coughs> the executive and uh, legislative branch to make laws without much control by the judiciary. So you say, well, what difference does that make? Well, that means that a lot of times you get a, a Papa Doc Duvalier, who was the ruler of Haiti in the 70s and 80s, and his family, and they robbed the Haitian treasury. They didn't really have any constraint or control from the judicial system of Haiti as to their actions. In the 90s, you had a President Aristide, who at times the U.S. backed. And he also plundered the Haitian uh, government's treasury without really any um, rule of law uh, exercised by judicial system to constrain them. That, that whole idea of the civil law, the role of the civil law, again, um, it's a legacy of uh, the French and, and Spanish colonization uh, in the Caribbean, um, I think has certainly influenced the position that Haiti's in. Now, Professor Morgan may talk about this as well, but have going along with this the whole problem of corruption. And Haiti ranks very high on the corruption perceptions uh, index. In fact, it's ranked consistently among the most corrupt countries in the world. So um, what uh, can be done to help out Haiti given that it has this kind of dilemma? Well, some have suggested that what might work best for Haiti is to, kind of, uh, to have a kind of Marshall Plan that we ought to have a Marshall Plan put in place for Haiti. Um, anybody ever heard of the Marshall Plan and what it did? And somebody remind us of what that was about, you remember? Um, it was in place after World War II to help restore East Europe and Haiti was devastated Yeah, and it was in Eastern, it was, it was a lot of Western Europe as well. Yeah, and, and uh, anybody have a sense of the scale of that, the Marshall Plan? It was a $13 billion effort, which amounts to uh, almost $80 billion in today's uh, uh, funds. And, and who paid for that Marshall Plan? The U.S. and to some extent the newly formed United Nations um, helped pay for it. And so the whole idea was infrastructure, the city centers, um, <clears throat> the factories that had been devastated in Germany, France, and really much of uh, Western Europe. Now, um, let's think about what uh, kind of uh, situation those nations were in prior to World War II. Uh, were they similar to Haiti in terms of 
having only half of their people literate, poor technologies, if, if at all, or not. Nick? Yeah, and so what could happen there? In that rebuilding structure and investment, they could build off of pretty high human capital, right? In other words, literacy and um, education levels, technologies. If we want to draw a parallel to Haiti in terms of having a Marshall Plan, it seems to me we've got to recognize some of the differences. Uh, one of the people behind this so-called Marshall Plan is Jeffrey Sachs. How many of you all heard of Jeffrey Sachs? But, uh, his work in other places, and um, he's one of these economists, you know, likes to hang out with Bono and make his way around the world and, and on the stage, and um, I don't know if he's shown a ball halftime, but he's sort of a, a, you know, very well known. And uh, he says, well, we ought to spend about 10 to $15 billion on a five-year kind of Marshall Plan for Haiti. Haiti needs water, sanitation systems, power systems, and... Um, this is what we ought to put in place. And by the way, he proposes how to pay for it, interestingly, to have a special tax on all the bonuses going out to Wall Street executives these days. Kind of an interesting proposal, you know, and uh, very uh, controversial bonuses going to Goldman Sachs and, and uh, Morgan Chase and those executives, and you tax them more heavily. Now, um, you know, it's interesting when we think about uh, that kind of direction. Haiti already has lots of aid organizations already in place. In fact, before the earthquake, it had more than 10,000 of them. Some estimates say that Haiti um, has, per person, per capita, more NGOs, more non-governmental organizations than any other nation in the world. And, and, and some of you guys are perhaps uh, familiar with those kinds of organizations, whether we think about World uh, Vision, uh, I'm kind of connected and help uh, out with uh, Mission to Haiti, uh, there's all kinds of groups like that in Haiti um, already. And they feed the poor, they provide basic health services, and, and so on. And yet still, um, people are skeptical as to how well a Marshall Plan might really work for Haiti. Because, um, well, frankly, because a number of these NGOs took a look before the earthquake at the... Um, success of their efforts in trying to um, help Haiti. And in fact, the world response a study why foreign aid to Haiti failed. And I'd encourage you, if you want to pursue this some more, look up that study on the internet, why foreign aid to Haiti failed. And it's an extensive study of what the World Bank and some other agencies did uh, over a period from 1986 to 2002, so roughly a 16-year period, and they look at, um, the, frankly, the way in which they weren't able to produce many sustainable benefits for Haiti. Why? Well, there's a lot to the study, but one of the things they said was, Haiti has a dysfunctional uh, government. It has a dysfunctional government, a dysfunctional budgetary system, a dysfunctional financial system. And this is one of the questions, frankly, about you know, having a Marshall Plan for Haiti. If you're talking about the scale of 10 to $15 billion coming into Haiti, does Haiti have in place a government that can manage it, direct it to its proper place, or will those funds get uh, diverted? Does this government have the capacity, uh, really even an administrative capacity, to pull off something like a Marshall Plan? And, and, you know, there are all kinds of worries about this, for example, just with what happens with the foreign aid that Haiti's received. Um, Haiti received 10 times as much aid in 2007, uh, $701 million, as it did in foreign investment. It's gotten a lot of foreign aid in prior to um, the earthquake. So, you, you know, say some food aid comes into Haiti, and as in many uh, developed nations, you get uh, food, uh, corn, wheat, uh, rice products, they come to the port. And what happens often is a couple, oftentimes a couple of things happen. One is that by um, people in authority who want to pass it on to their supporters. 
And so if there's a province, and Haiti's divided into these various provinces that are more supportive of the governing power, they're like uh, the crop that lands at the um, uh, port. Uh, that, of course, helps those, uh, those in power with their chances in the next election. Another portion of the crop uh, coming into the harbor will wind up on the black market. This increases the supply of grain short term in the market, drives down grain prices. What kind of incentives does that give for uh, longer term for Haitian farmers if rice and grain prices get driven down? Are they going to? Yeah, less. Right? They're not going to replant, right? They're less likely to, uh, you know, plant and harvest with that being the case, with this grain being dumped at extremely low prices. So, um, this is look um, at uh, the institutions that ought to be um, addressed in Haiti long term. We ought to look at uh, issues like um, having a clear rule of established property rights and um, the role of building up maybe a uh, Um, Haiti does very well all things, new balance shoes and other kinds of, you know, light clothing products. Um, but that's going to require the establishment of property rights and the rule of law. And um, I'm not convinced that a Marshall Plan of spending 10 to $15 billion will necessarily uh, do it. So um, anyway, those are kind of some of my thoughts about this. I'll, I'll turn it over to Professor Morgan here for a shot. Yes. kind of duplicates what Dr. Knoll said, so I'll try and do this quickly. I want to save as much time as we can for, uh, for Peter to uh, share about the orphanage there. So, But I'll, I'll try and uh, cover this a little, fairly quickly. And um, Some of the ideas that Dr. Knoll expressed are, are standard central ideas about how, over, how to overcome poverty in the context of uh, nations. And um, as I talk about economic systems in, in my principles class, uh, we talk about capitalism and democratic capitalism and uh, authoritarian socialism and so forth. Uh, but that leaves out the whole southern half of the world. And that southern half of the world uh, I like to describe as statist. Uh, it is a part of the world where most poor countries are, and uh, it is a, a part of the world where states tend to interfere uh, uh, greatly in, in uh, economic activity. So in a sense, poverty comes from oppression, uh, oftentimes oppression by the, the uh, governments of the countries that are being oppressed. And certainly there are, there are, there's oppression from outside as well uh, at times. But here you see um, Jesus uh, saying, the Spirit, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for, pris for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed and proclaim uh, the year of the Lord's favor. So as Christians, this 
project of freeing the oppressed is certainly a central Christian idea. And uh, the long term uh, to poverty and prosperity have to do, I think, a lot with the way these societies are set up and, and what the states are about. So uh, on that note, um, I've, I've thrown in a few of the pictures from, from the earthquake here as we go along. Uh, but some of the devastation that has just been announced in the last few days. Uh, the death toll has now topped 200,000, according to the Prime Minister. And, uh, you know, I don't know how accurate that is, but, but the disaster, the, the size of this disaster is huge. There are more than 200,000 people who have been clearly identified, according to this. Uh, another 300,000 injured. And, uh, um, and then 250,000 homes that have been destroyed, 30,000 businesses lost. Where does this come from? Is this, is this the result of the earthquake? Well, the immediate cause certainly is the earthquake. But uh, David Brooks wrote a, an article in the New York Times just uh, following... The, uh, the earthquake that got me thinking about this. And he, sa he said that the, the real problem is poverty. Uh, the, the reason the buildings fell is because they were poorly constructed. And why were they poorly constructed? Because the laws don't require good construction for one thing. For another thing, the... Uh, the incentives are missing. Uh, why are the incentives missing? A lot of times because private property laws are not adequate. And uh, as a result, people really are in a situation where they can't put too much revenue or too much uh, resources into construction of buildings because uh, they may not be secure in the rights to, to hang on to that building. Uh, and, of course, just general poverty being uh, part of the picture which keeps people from having adequate resources. So some of the, some of the big issues that uh, affect uh, whether or not nations succeed, whether they can generate sufficient prosperity to allow their people to live at reasonable standards of living. Uh, so, so I've pulled out some general data here. This is 150 different country spells, some uh, uh, data that shows that um, when we get in poverty. Now, that might seem obvious, but, but sometimes people say, well, economic growth only helps the, the rich and the poor lag behind it. And here is that uh, economic growth uh, reduces poverty. And so how do you get economic growth? That's, that's a fundamental uh, issue and one, of course, that, that economists are, are very interested in. Uh, another set of data, some of you have had regression analysis, and this is a, about as good a regression study as you're going to find as far as uh, the fit of the data. And uh, you see here uh, do the poor gain from general increases in income? And the answer is yes. According to this study, which is a pretty broad study and indicating that um, it would be very significant for uh, Haiti to be able to proceed on some kind of rapid economic growth. Is that possible? What do you think? Possible? Turn the country around fairly quickly? Are there any examples of poor countries that have turned around quickly? What? Yeah. The Tigers, yeah. They would be 
Two-thirds of the world's poor lived in what two countries about, if you went back about 10 to 15 years? China and India. Okay, China and India, India have both dramatically increased their, their growth rates, right? They're growing at, China's been percent uh, for a long time now, actually for 15 or more years. Uh, there might be some question about the accuracy of the data, but certainly they've had very growth. India has been growing at about 7 or 8 percent. How did they do that? In broad terms, how did they do that? Yeah, Aaron. Labor-intensive exports. Okay. Free trade has been a, uh, an important part. What about internally? Yeah, there's been, there have been huge obstacles to development in both India and China that have been removed. Right? India basically went bankrupt in about 1991. And uh, when they did that, system which was full of all kinds of obstacles, saying, okay, you can't do a business unless you get first permission from the anti-monopoly committee, and first you had to get permission to go to the anti-monopoly committee, and then if you wanted to do anything, sneeze, you had to get permission from somebody. <laughs> so, and you also had to get permission if you wanted to shut down your factory, you had to get permission from every one of your employees. Regulations, and that tends to be true of most countries that are in this kind of situation. So, um, what countries need? And you look at these oppressed. You know, this young boy has experienced horrendous difficulties for no reason. Uh, no, no personal reason. This is the result of the, the economic system that he's in, and then that combined with this disaster. Freedom, economic freedom, results in progress. This is very broad data, and it shows that as also increase their per capita income. And there's a lot of other things. They have people live longer. They have less disease. Um, they have better water. Uh, all kinds of progress occurs when we uh, increase freedom. So uh, unemployment. You know, anybody know the unemployment rate in Haiti? 30? closer to 90, yeah. It's, uh, I've seen 70 and 80 uh, percent as estimates of how much unemployment there is. Uh, that's monstrous. How, how can that be? How do you think people can be unemployed and still have enough food to live? Uh, the informal sector is always always big in these countries. When you have a statist economy, there's so many obstacles to doing anything normally. You have to do it illegally, essentially, and that's what we call informal, the informal economy. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen estimates up to 50 and 60 percent of the income comes from Haitians living outside of Haiti. So, um, you know, that shows you the, the impossibility. These people can be very productive if they get into a system that works. And that's almost always the case. Um, so it is the system that is <coughs> failing them and, uh, I would say, oppressing them. So status economies are poor economies. You look at the world and um, you see that the poor countries on this map, the darker countries are, are the, the wealthiest ones and the, the white ones are the poorest ones. You can see most of the poverty-stricken countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, as Dr. Knoll said, the poorest country in, in the West is Haiti. And uh, 
it is, <clears throat> I, I've seen estimates up to 80% of the people are below $2 a day poverty rate. So um, that goes with the 80% unemployment. So what does Haiti do? Uh, it does, I, I don't have a real exhaustive list. I haven't uh, studied Haiti all that much, but you look into any of these countries that's very poor, you find the same set of uh, problems usually uh, with some variations, but um, if you look at um, investment, restrictions on investment, um, public works or uh, infrastructure here, uh, telecommunications, electricity, water have uh, problems attached to them. You need to get a license or there are restrictions on, on uh, pr producing these things. Um, bribing public officials it always goes, whenever government sets up all these obstacles, then there are people standing there in your way when you want to do something. And you can either put up uh, in some cases, you can bribe them. And that's what they want, oftentimes, they want to bribe. And so what that does is set up incentives. If you want to get rich and you're living in one of these countries, what's the best thing to be? A bureaucrat, right? A bureaucrat collecting money. So uh, you have uh, bureaucracy being a big problem. Um, Haiti ranks 177th out of 179 countries in the Transparency Index. Uh, this is um, the Corruption Index, basically saying that Haiti is the second worst of the countries they rated. Its reputation as one of the world's most corrupt countries is a major impediment. So not only is the corruption a direct, it has a direct impact, but it also means uh, companies looking to operate their businesses and provide jobs and produce goods are not going to go to Haiti because this perception, to, to the extent it's true, of course, then that just uh, gets reinforced. But even the, the anticipation of that can be a problem. Uh, bribery is, is uh, observed there. Uh, trade is messed up by the same kind of bureaucracy and, and uh, regulations. And uh, starting a business in Haiti takes an average of 195 days. If you go through the, the bureaucracy, the world average is 38 days. In Hong Kong, it takes how long? Anybody remember? One day. One day. Remember, Stossel goes in, starts a, a business in one day. Yeah. So 195 days. Well, poor people can't afford to do that. That's oppression. And it results in poverty. And poverty results in disasters. Uh, <clears throat> getting a business license takes five times longer than the world average. Uh, 234 days. That's... Uh, I don't know what the three years stands for, what the connection is there. It doesn't look right, but uh, <laughs> as far as I know, there's 365 days in a year. So. Um, so these kinds of problems, the statism, um, I, I don't think I'll go on longer on this. Um, Other problems, inflation uh, typically is a problem. Uh, the president now uh, has gotten that somewhat under control. Uh, at least it's in better shape than it was in the recent past. Um, I was going to comment some about aid as well. Um, Dr. Knoll talked a little bit about it, but aid... Um, what, what is sometimes called government-to-government -government aid, big aid from the World Bank or the IMF going to governments of poor countries has been very ineffective. Why do you think? Yeah. Money. 
That's one of the problems, certainly, yeah, dependence. Where do you think the money goes? Do you think it goes to the... Swiss bank accounts. <laughs> yeah, Swiss bank accounts, right. Yeah, yeah, oftentimes, uh, and this has been the case in Haiti and a lot of places, that, that rulers or presidents or whatever will use their power to extract the money for themselves. And so aid has to be done very carefully. Uh, it has to be given with accountability and responsibility. And a lot of times what needs to be done is to take projects that are known to work. For example, uh, bed nets and malaria in Africa is a big problem. Uh, so people have given lots of money for bed nets or they've given bed nets, but uh, that hasn't translated into less malaria as much as it should have. Uh, even bed nets get ripped off or they get misused or uh, whatever. So there needs to be accountability and responsibility. And I think that's, that's a good place. I think I'm going to turn it over to Peter now to uh, talk about his uh, orphanage, which is a, an effective way of working with uh, the situation in Haiti. And um, I'll let him introduce it. So. Um. Uh, Child Hope. We Child Hope started about uh, six years ago, and we have a boys' orphanage and a girls' orphanage in, in Port-au-Prince. And uh, I'm actually going to let my wife explain how it how it actually got started. So, Joy, do you want to come up and? Um... Hi. Thank you. It's um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Oh, I cry every time I see this. I think I've seen it a thousand times, but it's so deep in my heart. I don't think this is on. Do we no, need it? It's, it's. Okay. in the Manaceros. They there because they knew that God placed his love in Ariana's heart for these Haitians. So they and the Preach the gospel, he'd walk out. Preach the gospel, he'd walk out. And so Suzette, Suzette came home, said, Joy, we've got a problem. We really need to pray. We pray. She's... world. We prayed in Haiti that we're 67, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, no one. So they prayed, and God brought a miracle. Which we were going to paid for bills. So they so they go back, and in the he's got perfect time. Drove up there, um, 
uncle was in jail and economy is so important, couldn't pay the rent, the lady came, chained up the house, 67 boys walking down the street by and nowhere. So they were down, they were walking up, they had a woman named Summer with them that was very, um, um, she'd known the boys and their faces, said there they are, they put them back in the truck and the Lord spoke to Bill's heart. Um, it was pouring rain. They're feeling, feeding him peanut butter and jelly. And the Lord spoke to Bill's heart and said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And Bill said, Lord, who are you going to send? And the Lord said, you. And he went, oh, my goodness. So he received that call, the Lord, first trip. So they moved over September 1st, five years ago, and began this. And it To 35 boys and then two years after that we um, we took um, how many girls off the street um, well at the first time six and then we were up to about 17 yeah we're up to 17 girls but everything about this has been God's heart of love like um, dr. Morgan said that the Spirit of the Lord is upon them because they know Jesus they've given up their lives for the least of um, God's little ones in Haiti and so that's what moved them there to come and love the orphans and so that's how they got there so um, that's that's how we started it was started from a pedophile's orphanage and that's not uncommon in third world countries matter of fact that's pretty common and um, because there's no regulation they they have free uh, reign in fact this pet a certain pedophile is still hanging around and uh, it's it's frustrating but but he is um, so what, what do we do there? We, of course, we have a boys' orphanage, a girls' orphanage, and, um, but we're not just that. Um, it's very important for us to have neighborhood outreach. So we have, uh, we have a clinic. Uh, we do um, a feeding program. There are what we call the ravine kids, and um, you know what a ravine is? <laughs> a ravine is a, you know, a steep gully with a little creek or river running through it. And the poorest of the poor basically live in the ravine, and they, they live in little shacks in the ravine. And these kids don't eat very often. Um, so we do a feeding program for about 100 of these kids three times a week. And, um, uh, and then and since the earthquake, we've, we've started that back up again. We've also started what we call our Maison de Luminaire school, or the, um, Maison de Luminaire, or the lighthouse, is what we call our orphanage. And the reason why you do that is because it was a French slave trading port, Port-au-Prince was, and uh, that's, um, I, I don't know that there are any indigenous Haitians around, but, um, but the, the, the slaves are there, and, uh, or the, the former slaves, I should say, the, the generations from the former slaves. And, uh, but the French um, established a school system that's not very good. It's essentially by rote memory. There's very little analytical skills training. So what we wanted to do is on our, our youngest orphans, we started with kindergarten, now we're working our way up. I think we're at second, or second grade or so. We want to teach them really the American system, analytical thinking, and so on. So we're doing that as well. We also send many of the neighborhood kids to school. There are no public schools in, in Haiti. They're all private. They cost about, it cost about 150. By the time you get uh, uh, books and clothing, a uniform, it's about $200 a year to send your child to school. Most, most kids don't go to school because it's so expensive. The $200 is, is so expensive. So we, we send many of the neighborhood kids to school. Um, so really our, our vision it, we're not an orphanage that is going to, um, as a crash, we're not an orphanage to raise kids up or to bring kids in to send them to the United States. We're an orphanage that we want to train kids, um, disciple them, uh, introduce them to Christ, uh, give them vocational training, and send them back out into this Haitian society to, to make change. And, and that's really what we want to do. That's, that's from our little, little point of view. That's where we think we can make the greatest change in Haiti is through uh, men and women who have um, been discipled, have become, uh, have a great strong faith in Christ, and then can go out in their neighborhoods with a, with a job skill and, uh, and make change. Um, and um, we do that by education, discipleship, vocational training, uh, community service is a big deal. We have all of our kids doing community service within our, our neighborhood. We also do medical outreaches to remote uh, villages 
uh, around the area. How we got there, we explained that, um, I think, already. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about a few, um, just a few life stories, just to put a face to, to, these, uh, to some of our kids. This is Tebow, which means little heart. Tebow, um, Tebow's mother died uh, giving birth, I think, to her 10th child, so her, his blind uncle brought Tebow and his brother to us. Tebow was four years old and weighed 12 pounds. And to give you perspective, my um, four-month-old grandson weighs 14 pounds. And we didn't think Tebow was going to live. Uh, my daughter, who lived there at the time, you know, they just basically fed him and nursed him. And after a few days, he started eating again. And they thought, you know, perhaps he would have brain damage. He would be, you know, severely handicapped, but he would be alive. Well, not the case. Uh, my daughter taught the, the first preschool class. He's the smartest kid in the class, learned English like that, and uh, just is just thriving. Um, there's a picture of him a year ago or so, just, you know, thriving, having, having a great time. Let, let me just say a footnote here. We, we've been involved with... Um, Ministries helping the homeless in the LA area, and I think it's a, it's a vital ministry, something to do. It, it should be done, and so on. But it's also a frustrating ministry because um, uh, so often they're they're in bondage to drugs, and they get on their feet a little bit, and then they kind of kind of very quickly go back into drugs, and it's kind of this cycle. Um, our experience working with Haitian children is that when you um, feed, clothe, water, educate, disciple, many of them just blossom and turn into young men and women just like you. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, but for the economy that they're in, but for the religious system that they're in, um, as a side note there, uh, when, um, when Haiti was created as a democracy a, a little over 200 years ago, the slaves revolted against their French slave traders. And um, uh, their, uh, when they were victorious, they dedicated that victory to voodoo um, or to Satan. So essentially, voodoo is a national religion of um, Haiti. As you drive around, you'll see witch doctors, um, um, homes, places all over the place. I can tell you all kinds of witch doctor stories later uh, another time. But, um, but, it, but it, it, it is a country really in bondage to the religion, to the power of Satan, and that is a, a huge issue that must be addressed for there to be change in Haiti. And again, from our perspective, by um, discipling kids, neighborhoods, to see the truth of Christ, that uh, we think that it will provide a lot of change. Um, Cindy was um, the uh, niece of a staff worker of ours, uh, Cindy was born to a young, boy, a young girl who had a relationship with a young boy. Uh, they were not married, which is very often the case in Haiti. Uh, they didn't want her, so they were going to leave her on the city dump, and, which was kind of a normal way to deal with uh, young babies that you don't want. And uh, fortunately, um, Matilia's son um, rescued her. And uh, Matilia, whose husband was killed, he was a tap-tap driver. You guys know what a tap-tap is? A yeah, tap-tap is a picture of the most beat-up, old pickup truck you can imagine with a little kind of covered wagon on it, and everyone jumps in it, and that's their taxis, and it's called a tap-tap because when you get to where you want to go, you tap-tap, and he stops, and you pay the guy, and you're, you're gone. So that's a tap-tap. Anyway, uh, Matilia's um, husband was a tap-tap driver. He was killed, and... Um, she already had, I think, six or seven children, but she agreed to take Cindy in, and um, even though she really couldn't afford to feed Cindy, but she did. And so when we opened our girls' home, uh, Cindy was one of our first girls who came in, and um, she is a beautiful girl. She has that face like a model. Um, you'll see her one day, and you think, who is that? And, oh, that's Cindy. She just did her hair differently or whatever, and she's just has that look about her, she's, she's a, she, she's, and she's a beautiful young girl and really developing. She, um, when she came to us, she had a, a real fear of men, and, uh, but she has worked through that, and, and she's really blossoming and turning into a beautiful young, young woman. Um, how did we first take in our orphans? Of course, you, you, the story about the pedophile's orphanage, 
but how did we get in the, the balance of the 40-some kids? Um, we, the, the Manasseras would drive down the streets and they would get to know the kids. Um, children in Haiti, um, what happens is that, that the, um, the vast majority of Haitians live in the greater Port-au-Prince area. It, it's a ratio of maybe um, uh, 60 to 80 percent of the population lives in the greater Port-au-Prince area. What happens is if parents die or if parents can't afford to feed their kids in the provinces, outlying provinces, they'll take their children into Port-au-Prince and drop them off. And they'll say, good luck, hope you do well, because I can't feed you and you know, you'll make a good life for yourself on the street. So as you drive up and down what's called the Delmas, which would be the equivalent of our State Street, or if you're in LA, your Wil Wilshire Boulevard, and um, which is the main business street, um, kids will run in and out of the cars and they'll be begging, they'll be washing your wind windows, whatever. And um, what happens is these kids become rescuviks or child slaves and they, they um, work for their quote unquote aunt or uncle, which is really their, their slave owner. Uh, so anyway, the, the Manasseras would go, they, they'd build relationships with these kids and to the extent that they could get permission from their um, guardian, uh, and then, of course, governmental uh, permission, we would take the kids in. And uh, so we started the girls' home. We took in about, um, I think, six girls at the beginning. We have about 17 now. Um, Joy and I were at in Haiti when we took the first six in, at least for just a one-day deal. If you've ever been around a pack of wild dogs, they had no discipline. They were going everywhere. That's what these six girls were like. They did not know how to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. When we brought them in, basic hygiene. Uh, when my daughter washed their hair, just black gunk came down and probably never had a bath or a shower. And, um, you know, basic don't go potty in the front yard, you know, <laughs> there's toilets and all that. So, but um, they, they've, um, like I said, uh, the power of Christ, the transforming power of Christ and love. And, um, and so we've got a group of beautiful young girls and um, they are, they're doing extremely well. Uh, the boys, uh, again, same deal, um, first group of them through the pedophiles, but then you know, just getting to know them, and our goal is to try to go after the poorest of the poor, those that um, have no parents and are just kind of fending uh, for themselves. Um, so what are we doing now? Uh, now that the earthquake hit, we're, we're continuing with our original goal with the orphans, of course. We're expanding our medical clinic. Uh, we had a medical triage set up after the earthquake hit. We treated over 500 patients, anything from cuts and bruises to amputations. We were, we were doing amputations on our, you know, basically on the kitchen sink of the uh, boys' home. Um, we're going to help provide, well, we are helping providing temporary housing, like a little tent city, and we're going to help rebuild uh, some of these houses, the little, little shacks that have been broken down. And, um, and then, of course, where our boys uh, and girls, uh, the educational system is, is down. I mean, the, the Department of Education building is destroyed, and many of the Haitian schools are destroyed. So now we, we're trying to figure out how to recreate um, the school year for our kids. So if any of you want to take uh, this semester off and go to Haiti and uh, become a teacher, you are more than welcome to come and talk to me um, about that. But just some statistics, uh, approximately 80% of the downtown buildings were destroyed. About 20% uh, of the homes around us were destroyed, as well as the edu Haitian uh, educational system. And uh, so where does that leave us? Um, pray for change, um, not for life to come back at, as normal in Haiti. In, in some ways, it is. Uh, my son-in-law just got back from, from being there. And he said, you know, life is now just going on. And people are walking around the rubble and just carrying on. And in some ways, that's a bad thing. Uh, it would be good for the Haitian people to wake up and, um, you know, repent from voodoo and Satanism and turn towards Christ. Um, uh, pray for our, our boys and girls. If, if you thought, you know, the video that I showed at the beginning was before the earthquake, and that's pretty bad. Uh, and can imagine after the you can imagine if you're the poorest of the poor and the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, um, and you are uh, an orphan to boot, and now you've got to figure out how to get a job. You the only way jobs are kind of doled out in Haiti is essentially through relationships. So if you know someone, you get a job. It's not really through education; it's really through um, relationships. And um, and you thought you 
you know, your hope for the future was a little bit questionable at that point. Now imagine your downtown is destroyed, your economy is upside down, and where's your hope in future? So, so pray, pray for that. And, and then pray that, that our efforts are recognized as the love of Christ, that, that, you know, that Christ really is glorified through the efforts of, of child hope. So that's, that's my presentation. Um, I could take questions, or um, we also have a short video showing our triage, but a lot of you guys have seen the, all the stuff on CNN anyway. But, uh, yeah. They said, you know, after CNN leaves and ABC and NBC, and we're, what, three, four weeks after, it's now up to the body of Christ to get in there and to and let the light shine brightly in such a way that the, an unbelieving will believe because of our good works, because of the love of God. We aren't saved by good works. We're saved for good works that he prepared before the foundation of the world for us to walk in. And I just want to challenge all you students. Um, this, um, the whole um, ministry was birthed through the love of God through a child. And it says, let the child led um, Bill and Suzette, and what we didn't share with you, Suzette rescued two little children that we have now adopted. We have a seven-year-old um, little girl. I helped teach Jenny to read kindergarten one semester. Thank God. I just the body of Christ. Katie looks hopeful, but it's not. Because I really believe that Suzette and I talked. Uh, Haiti used to be called the world is coming. And if you read Isaiah 8, Isaiah 55, your story of miracle after miracle. Who works for us? He lived down the street, um, godly trained in um, in YWAM and when everything fell all the houses around him fell and his house remained standing and he stood on his front porch in his way, ha way Haitians pray merci Jay-Z thank you Jesus he was worshiping God all the neighbors saw him worship the Lord Jesus Christ and they knew that God took care of his house and they all came to Christ okay Erta who works with us she lives in our girls home or a pastor, a very godly, intact family. She was in school, and you saw the pictures of the schools. She and her brother crawled out without a scratch. She just um, sprained her ankle. And if you go through scripture, go. I just challenge you kids, get in, get in Isaiah, get in um, the Psalms, and you will see that the Lord has taken care of Bill and Suzette. They proclaim Jesus, Jesus And then down belief, it's uh, down below. It says, "Though ten thousand may fall and a thousand by your side, no harm will befall you." And so, because for some reason God protected this ministry, we just had um, everybody was fine except Daphne broke her little leg. But God provided an orthopedic to proclaim the light of Christ. And what we've talked about is there's going to be rebuilding. But this rebuilding isn't going to be your smartest economics person. It's going to be the brains that God's given you, your love for economics. But it's going to get to prayer. Give me creativity. My crippled mom, and they're so worried. When they, you guys graduated, look where you are. It's so you're so blessed to be in a wonderful, godly Christian college. Our kids don't have that hope. So we need the body of Christ extraordinaire here to call upon the name of Jesus because all wisdom, godly wisdom, comes from God to put the ideas in your hearts, in your heads, and your minds birthed out of love. You're not doing it to make money. You're not going to do it for pride to be famous. You're going to do it because you love the poor, the orphan, the widow, the homeless. And that's the call of Isaiah 58. In Isaiah 58, it says, what kind of does God delight in to loose to set the captives free, and it says, is it not to divide? 
divide your bread with the hungry and not hide yourself from your own flesh. And then it says you'll call. He'll say, here I am. I want to do that. I want to call upon the Lord. And he'll say, here I am. The glory of the Lord will be my rear guard. And it says, um, if you stop the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness, if you give your soul to the afflicted, and it says, those from among you, Isaiah 58, you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will be the repairs of the breach, the restores in the streets in which to dwell. And I can't think of a more blessed group of young men and women if you guys just get together and get on your faces and ask the Lord Jesus to give you wisdom on how because I, I, the light is already there on the lighthouse the whole world is showing and one other really exciting thing Jonathan Olin DVD CNN has hired him to do a 35 minute on Maison de Lumiere and it's going to tell the story of Jesus and God's love privilege to be here because I really believe that God will use you young ones so. yeah, yeah. yeah sure any questions yes Yeah, yeah. R right now, um, because of the earthquake, we're just sending in kind of specialized people, like people that build walls and so on, and medical teams. But very shortly, um, it, for the last two years now, our third year, we'll take a team from USC, and then right after us, a team from UCLA will go. But we, we send teams throughout the year there, and um, you'd be involved in doing a medical outreach, feeding programs, just playing with the kids, teaching the kids, Bible studies with the kids, um, uh, you know, just any, any number of work projects, construction projects, yeah. Yeah, generally go for about a week, 10 days, something like that. So yeah, there's a lot to do there. Um, it's a real eye-opener, yeah. Yeah, yes? You know, honestly, people have been really generous with this earthquake, and, and um, we've, we've almost received our annual budget just in earthquake relief donations right now. Uh, I would say the greatest need is just humans, uh, Christians that would want to come and, and hands and feet to, to help there. Um, you know, we need teachers, we need um, uh, just, yeah, Bible, Bible teachers, um, educational teachers. Clinic, um, there's, yeah, I, I would say that's probably our greatest need, yeah.